So a couple of days ago, a tree fell down onto the primary power line from my neighborhood, and it's a 15,000 volt line, and it happened about 200 feet from my house, and my poor transformer outside of my house was not happy, and neither was uh, stuff in my house. And why am I saying this? Well, it actually killed the uh, triac here inside of the 1500 watt grid charger. This is a part that I added. And I want to talk about kind of what happened and what I'm going to do to fix it. Um, so the, this external event caused a massive overvoltage in my house. Now I do have uh, two uh, panel mounted metal oxide varistors, which are over voltage suppression devices. One of them was destroyed in the process. Uh, also a smoke detector in my house was destroyed, but nothing else was. And this is just because uh, the UL standards for uh, electronics that plug into mains nowadays are very, very, very strict for selling goods for consumers in the US. And so they typically will have a very large EMI suppression filter. You can just literally buy them off the shelf. In fact, a lot of the um, IEC uh, power inputs that you know a standard computer cable will just have them built into them. Uh, and then this, of course, this grid charger itself has a very large snubber circuit here. This is just an RFI uh, uh, line filter. And so these are big capacitors, these are big inductors, and you make a really nice tank circuit so that 60 hertz, 50 hertz can get through, but you know, a megahertz or whatever when you have a really large over voltage event that is happening from a transformer shorting out and then disconnecting and you have that inductive flyback, uh, this will absorb that. Now the problem is, is that this triac that I put here was uh, before this circuit. It literally is switching this on and off. Now one thing I want to mention here before we get into this, this is one of just three protection elements that prevent the grid charger from overcharging the batteries. So one of the three uh, devices failed. Two of the three devices were still working. So the only reason I knew that this happened was one, a tree fell down and I didn't have power for a day or two, um, or at least I shouldn't have, we used a generator. But anyway, um, the point I'm trying to make here is that at no point was the safety violated as far as overcharging the battery. Uh, so the only reason, I, again, I knew this happened was the tree actually fell down. And then uh, of course I know what should be happening just because I designed this product and uh, I saw that the behavior was not correct, specifically there are some fans that this uh, 1500 watt grid charger runs uh, when it's actually on, and those were staying on even after the grid charging finished. And that's just because the way that it's powered, that it, that's expected behavior when the grid charger's on. And because this triac failed, uh, the fans never turned off. It's the only reason I knew it. Um, so this is a not a detectable failure. It's like LIBCM can't tell that this failure has occurred. Um, if all three failure mechanisms failed, LIBCM can actually detect that. Uh, there's not anything you can do about that. It can just start beeping at you. And of course, if you're not there, that's problematic. But again, that's why you have these redundant mechanisms. So today we are only talking about one of the three mechanisms and that's this triac here. Uh, the second mechanism is there's actually a, uh, a low voltage isolated cutoff here that LIBCM uses. And the third one actually on the 1600 watt charger is that the output voltage is actually configurable. So you can actually set that to say 240 volts and then it can never charge over 240 volts on say a 60S setup. Uh, so the chances of this failure causing um, overcharging the batteries are, are very, very remotely impossible. And that's why you have three of these circuits and they're all different. But I still want to fix this issue and I wanna talk about what the issue is and how it is that we fix it. So what I have, and I'm gonna actually turn this uh, light off because it's gonna be a little bit too bright here and I'm not gonna cut over to a computer monitor because I try to make these videos easy for me to make. Um, everything you see here that's printed, you know, was ink screened off of a laser, uh, is on LIBCM itself. It's this uh, circuit right here. And we'll look at that again when I turn the light on. And everything that's hand drawn is what I have added uh, to actually control the 1500 watt charger. The onboard triac here, let me just flip this light on for a sec. The onboard triac here, uh, it can't run the 12, 13 amps at this pole. It's why there's, there's this uh, discrete triac right here. And so this triac is actually running that triac. And so if we look again at the circuit here, uh, when I did the original LIBCM design, 
we basically switch the actual grid charger current through this triac here. That's this big honker heatsink right there. That's basically this. You can see the heatsink there. And uh, this heatsink is actually line voltage, so don't touch it when it's plugged in. Uh, it does have a, a clear cover, obviously, so you can't do that when it's installed in the car. Uh, but on the bench, it's a possibility. Uh, anyway, so what we do instead uh, is we use this triac when, when we're running the 1500 watt charger because it just pulls too much input current. Uh, it's it's really the both the tracks are rated for the same current. It's the fact that this one is sinking into this uh, extruded aluminum rail, whereas this one is only sinking into that smaller heat sink there. Uh, this thing on 120 volts at full current is uh, about 13 amps, 12 to 13 amps. The the uh, UL limit for continuous consumption after four hours is 12 amps, and so that's what this is trying to do. And 12 amps is simply too much. It's about 14 watts, and this can only handle about seven or eight watts, and so that we sink into the case there. Anyway, um, I tried to get a little bit uh, sneaky here and do an engineering task that uh, ultimately did not work. And so let's talk about it here, and this is just real high level. Uh, you don't need to be an electrical engineer. I'm gonna just kind of explain some concepts here. So we have this triac driver, which is a diac, basically. It's a light controlled uh, triac, but it's, it's not, it doesn't have a gate. The, the tr uh, diacs themselves and triacs themselves are just a, a thyristor pair and anti-parallel. And if you don't actually encapsulate, uh, which means you know, prevent light from getting in. Uh, if you don't encapsulate a triac or a diac, it's actually photosensitive. So if you shine light on it, it will actually trigger. Uh, and so that's all this device does. This is an opto isolator. This is a safety thing so that you don't have high voltage coming over onto your low voltage system. So you basically have this diac, triac, whatever, and we're driving it with an LED. And that is driving the gate on this triac here. And what we have is a snubber. And this snubber actually works really well when you have these over voltage events when this is off, when the LED is off, this is an open circuit and the triac gate is just never driven. And so the triac is never driven. And so you actually have the line one and line two or, or neutral if you're at 120 volts in the US. And so you could have the full line voltage, say 240 volts or 120 volts RMS going across this triac when it's off. And this is a, an 800 volt triac, as is this also an 800 volt triac here, but we're not talking about that yet. And what you do is you have a snubber here and this snubber basically increases that voltage range because uh, the high frequency components, say when a tree falls on your primary line and blows stuff in your house out, uh, you basically have an alternate path here through this 100 ohm resistor coming up through through this 22 nanofarad cap. And so this is gonna eat up the uh, what otherwise would be an over voltage event. Now this isn't sinking uh, power like a, um, uh, if you had a TVS diode or a, a metal oxide varistor in there, we're not actually sinking as joule heat here. All this is doing is it's taking high frequency components and it's making the line one side uh, basically the same voltage. And so because this whole thing is floating, if you have a million volts there and a million and 100 volts there, this is still gonna be fine because we don't have 800 volts across uh, the MT1 or MT2 terminals. So this, this snubber works really well. And in fact, this is the actual unit here. Come back over there. This is the actual unit that was installed and it was plugged in um, while I was grid charging when this tree fell down. And I actually have two other um, LIBCMs. One is a standard uh, five amp power G3, which only uses this circuit. It's not, it's not using this bigger supply. And it, it works just fine. This one here, which is actually controlling this unit right here, uh, this part of it survived just fine. And I have a third one, which is also doing 5 amp G3. It, it survived as well. So in all three cases, the um, LIBCM side survived. And I'll, I'll explain to you why that is here. Or rather, I just did explain that. We have a snubber here. And that snubber is, it. this is bringing up our um, maximum MT1, MT2 voltage from about 800 volts to probably around 4,000 volts or so. It, you'd really have to go in and look at the nano henries of inductance you have there to really calculate that. But it's somewhere around 4,000 volts uh, instead of 800. Now, I tried to get tricky and you know say some, com some component out here. I don't have any of this external snubber protection here because I was thinking, well, I have this snubber here and it will actually trigger the triac on, but that's not actually true. We'll look at that in a second. So this poor 
track here, which is also hooked up line two, line one, that's basically through here. We, we tap them off right here and those feed into this triac. This guy here got that full, say two, 3000 volts uh, of over voltage here from MT1 to MT2. It never triggered uh, because this didn't actually trigger and it, it caused this to fail short. Now, it, there's no mechanical damage. I looked at a scope, there's no mechanical damage. It's just that MT1 is permanently shorted MT2 now. Uh, so the grid charger does still work, um, but you can't turn it on and off. That's why those fans were stuck on. And again, the other two safety components prevented the grid charger from actually charging, but of course you want this one to work here. Um, so what do we do? So the first thing we do is we could add this same snubber or a similar snubber here, the 100 ohms and the you know maybe 10 nanofarads or whatever there. Um, we could add that here in the exact same way from uh, L1 to you know, across the triac basically, uh, MT1 to MT2. That would work just fine. Uh, however, I have already uh, built all of these grid chargers. They're all already assembled and ready to go. And I don't necessarily wanna have to open these all back up. I have to take them off their frames and then I have to actually come in here, remove this and then cut heat shrink off. It would be a lot of work. It would take me over a day to do that. So instead what I'm going to do is, uh, this is this is me trying to be tricky here again. Uh, I'm gonna take uh, here and take um, basically a tunneling uh, diode here, a TVS diode, and I'm going to put this from the gate to, uh, what is this, MT2 there, yeah, that makes sense. I have it kind of drawn here as well. And this circuit right here will basically make it to where, this is a 376 volt RMS uh, peak rather, this is a 376 volt peak uh, breakdown avalanche diode. So this will basically avalanche over if you exceed, you know, 400 volts or whatever, and that will cause this gate to fire, which will immediately cause this gate to fire, which will basically turn on for one power line cycle, actually for half of the power line cycle until your next zero crossing, it will turn this on. And when it's on, uh, it, you know, again, you could have 800 volts on this line here. And as long as it's on, it's very low resistance. And so you're not going to develop an 800 volt delta across this, you might develop 10 volts or something, which would be very high. Um, so the cool thing about this is that I can literally just solder this onto the LIBCM PCBs. So I can just put that right here. And it's like just going from there to there. There's two terminals, they're very readily accessible. Um, so I'm going to do that instead. And of course I need to make sure that that works. Um, so we'll have some fun testing there with a flyback transformer. Um, destructively, I'm sure. If that doesn't work, then I can actually take and add the same uh, component here, and I can, this is BZW04376B, B means it's bipolar, so it's blocking in both ways, uh, whereas a unipolar would only block in one direction. You'd use the same model number for like a DC supply. We're using the AC variant of it. So I can put the same thing here out here, and I can do that fairly easily because all I have to do is bring it from um, MT2 to the gate. And uh, the gate is this red wire and MT2 is uh, this wire there. So I can basically go and add this to all these power supplies without having to take them off, without having to uh, destruct them. And it would probably only take me four hours instead of like 15 or something, 16 hours. So anyway, that is kind of what is up here. I did a little bit of research. I'd never, you know, I've done a lot of offline stuff, but I've never actually done the, the testing variants. And typically offline just means you plug it into a wall. Typically I'm just, you know, using someone else's off the shelf solution or I'm using their IEC connector or whatever. Um, an easier solution to this would really just be to say, uh, you know, plug this into a surge protector, right? But that's not, that's not the right solution. Uh, and again, I, I use this power supply, and not again, I haven't said it yet, but I use this power supply for seven months and it worked just fine. It's just that we had this massive over voltage event. And you know, if it had blown out at like every TV or whatever in my house, you know, I don't have a TV in my house, but if it had broken everything in my house, then I'd say, okay, fine, whatever. But because I only broke this and a smoke detector, uh, I, you know, I don't want to be the lowest hanging fruit on the totem pole there. So I did a little bit of research on this UL standard and basically uh, for, for how this is being used, um, you basically have to design your product to withstand uh, 2000 volts from line to neutral um, 
for like 10 milliseconds or something. And so, uh, you know, another option is you could add a MOV or whatever. That was my first thing I was going to do is I was just going to put an MOV, a metal oxide varistor, you know, from line to neutral here. Uh, but actually, it would have been unfused. Uh, it, it wasn't the right solution. So I, I opted not to do that. Um, anyway, that is kind of what I've been looking at here for a little bit now. I hate to actually have to jump back into the engineering phase. But on the other hand, I'm kind of glad this happened to me and not to all of the customers in the field when a tree fell down and shorted out stuff in their house. So anyway, uh, I did want to show here just lastly, I've got this LIBCM program to just turn the grid charger on and off uh, every few seconds. Uh, this is how I've been doing some of this testing. So I'm going to plug this in and hopefully not kill myself on camera. Okay, might get a little spark here. All right. So what we have here is we have two, sorry, I hit the mic. We have uh, two channels here. Uh, the first channel, which is the yellow trace, is, um, I might need to turn this light off, let's see. Yeah, you can kind of see it. That looks better though. So, uh, the first trace here is um, the yellow trace. This is the current. And the second trace right now is the voltage on the output of the triac here. So it's basically the input voltage to this supply. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plug this guy in. This is just a glorified on and off switch right now. And so this is actually turning on. You can see the event here. We'll go ahead and stop after this first event. And this is just gonna turn it on and off every 10 seconds or so. Uh, I'm actually loading the output, which is why I have this heater sitting in water. This water does get quite warm. I have a, another heater right here that is a little bit higher capable. And these are just in series, but that one's sinking the majority of the power. Um, so anyway, let me go ahead and unplug this so we're not just needlessly ruining this uh, this uh, device and this triac. I did run it for about an hour, so it's about 360 on-off cycles. Again, I ran this for seven months without problems, so uh, this was certainly an overvoltage, a massive overvoltage spike on our line. Uh, but anyway, yeah, if we look at what's happening here, um, you can see, uh, let's see. So, wow, we hit this just, just right. And by just right, I mean at the worst possible time. So uh, the triac when we're turning on, it's not a zero crossing turn on. Uh, so we literally just turn on wherever we are in the phase. We don't know where the 60 hertz, we don't know what, how many degrees we are in, in this. And so we hit this basically right at the peak, which is good. This means we're gonna have the highest inrush here. Um, so yeah, this is good. And um, you know, the, the, the best place to hit it is is if you hit it right at the zero crossing because there's no current at that point in time. I will point out that this supply is a power factor correcting supply. That's what we're seeing here at the beginning. We're seeing this, um, this power factor circuit and we're seeing some switch off that's happening because the current is so low, we're trying to re-trigger this thing on and on and on, but there's a minimum holding current that we're not hitting. Uh, eventually the supply says, okay, fine. We've got, we've, we figured this out. Let me zoom out a little bit and here, we figured out, and so we're like one, two, three. So about a half a second later, we actually say, oh, okay, cool. Here is our um, actual device here. Let me make sure this is plugged in. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so anyway, this is our actual current consumption. Uh, and you can see eventually our power factor correction stuff stops uh, beating us here. Uh, we, we get our phase aligned you know you want your current and voltage to be aligned properly to get your power factor eventually we get that all done and then our gate will just trigger once per zero crossing uh, but when you're zoomed in there it doesn't look like you'll ever get there uh, i think we got it here we might have just barely captured it here now we're, we're getting there but you gotta just trust me here that um, we do eventually get there it, we could trigger this again at 200 milliseconds uh, i'm sure that y'all all glazed over at this point anyway uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that this isn't an issue where um, the, you know, the triac just failed because uh, it's being used out of spec or something. Uh, this is, it looks very, very good. Let's go over here to like t equals one second or whatever. Yeah, we're still not quite there, but you gotta just trust me, we, we get there. The, the power factor stuff is pretty fun, but uh, it can give you some oddities in your waveforms. Um, Anyway, it looks good now, and I think I have a solution on this. Uh, of course, all of these annoying things uh, just mean that it takes even longer to ship this product. But um, I, you know, I, I have 
at least three different solutions here that will work. Uh, I'm gonna order some parts tomorrow, tonight maybe. Yeah, I'll order them tonight so that they get here by the end of the week. And um, yeah, so uh, this was more technical than I thought it was going to be, but uh, as always, thanks for watching. R rounding it in right at 20 minutes.